All right. So what's happening with church is we're juggling complementary but sort of competing needs and visions as well. So just think in our own personal lives, we have a 24-hour cycle where we have what I call rituals of maintenance, where we have to sleep, we have to eat, we have to shower. They're rituals of maintenance. And we need them to stay strong, to stay healthy. But if that's all we do, we get dull and we might even fade away. So in our 24-hour cycle, we have also what are called rituals of disruption, where you might have to exercise, go for a run. And these rituals of disruption actually throw you, but they make your body come back stronger because your body now has to readapt to a new stressor. So you actually become fitter, faster and stronger. But if that's all you do, you will break down. So somehow, even in our 24-hour cycle, we need to juggle complementary but competing needs of maintenance but disruption. And you see that in our yearly cycle as well. Rituals of maintenance are going to work, commuting, but you need a disruption like a family holiday. And the two, so you go, so you think, oh, I just want to get back. You get back, so you want to go, so you can see how they feed off each other. And church is actually the same. Churches exist for rituals of maintenance. That's why the service starts at the same time. People sit in the same seats. You have liturgy. There's actually something nice about familiarity, tradition, and doing things the same thing year after year, week after week. That's why you come for Christmas and Easter. So by doing that, we are built up. We actually maintain and we stay healthy. But again, if that's all we do then you become dull, you might slowly um, fade away. So then you need rituals of disruption in your church where you try to think, okay, we need evangelism, we need to reach out, we need outreach, we also need to be attractional. And um, they make your church stronger. But again, if that's all you do, your church will break down. The the regulars think, we're just reaching out, what about my own needs? I need to be fed, I need to be looked after. So somehow they're complementary, but... But, but competing, and that's what we're facing as a church. Also, someone explained to me, it's like drawbridge up or drawbridge down. So do we come, so it's drawbridge up so I feel safe, or is it drawbridge down so people come, but then now I feel threatened? So just imagine my weekly Bible study, every week there were new people. After all, it becomes quite threatening and might even weaken the Bible study. So somehow we need a, a combination of drawbridge up and drawbridge down. And someone pointed out to me, architecture sort of reflects where you are in that way. So somewhere along the line, post offices and banks will drawbridge up. You come to be safe. And that's why it's all brick buildings with a big solid door. You come here, your money, your mail here is safe. But then when it became a private enterprise and needed outside business to survive, it became all glass front doors that embrace the street to welcome you in. And churches were sort of juggling that. Where are we? We draw a bridge up so we can turn up and feel safe. And you can see a lot of the older generation come for that, don't they? They want to come. They want quiet. They want peace. They want a little five minutes of silence before the service starts to gather themselves where they can escape the world, draw a bridge up. Whereas young people come and they want the band, the music, they want you to engage with us. Oh, well, they want drawbridge down. So somehow we're juggling two, and we need to see them as complementary rather than contradictory, but both are needed in the, in the life uh, of the church. That's the first thing I want to say in wrapping up. Second thing I want to say is somehow all of the service is evangelistic. So I remember when we first used to run our February Friends service, the temptation was to strip down the service and make it as simple as possible. Just get up, have an MC welcome, and get straight to the Bible talk because that's where you know, the evangelism, the gospel is happening. But slowly I started to realise, no, the whole service is evangelistic. From the presiding to the prayer to the singing, even the announcements. Because a non-Christian sitting there going, as they're listening to the announcements, they're thinking, their young people meet on a Friday night? Huh, I'd like my kids to be able to do that, meet with other nice people on a Friday night, and at least I know where they are. Huh, they pray for their old people. They take meals to people who've just had babies. They're, they're, they're caring for someone with cancer. They're hearing that announcement thing. Huh, you know, they're hearing the gospel in action, actually, in the announcements. So start writing the announcements, knowing that non-Christians are going to hear your announcements. They're not just for the believers, they're for the non-believers. And the prayer, they are 
my non-believer friends, when they come, they're blown away by the prayer. They say, I didn't know you could pray to God. Like That, that is foreign to anyone who's, who's not a Christian. You do not pray to God like that in any other religion. I didn't know you could pray like that. And then they hear what we pray for. They have no idea. You pray for other people, that, that blows them away. So, so the prayers become evangelistic. They think, oh, this is what it looks like. And then the Lord's Supper is the one that really maintains the tension between drawbridge up and drawbridge down because the, you have to explain the elements. And I, my quick, simple one is this three-sentence formula. In this meal, we celebrate, we remember that Jesus once ate a meal like this with his followers. Then he used his meal as a symbol for his death for us on the cross. But then he used the meal to say, one day I'm going to come again, set up a kingdom where you can eat with me again. And that's what we're celebrating. So we're remembering and looking forward. But Jesus asked his followers to celebrate this meal. So if you're not a follower yet, watch what we do and we look forward to that time when you too follow Jesus and you can celebrate with us. So it's drawbridge down, look at what we do. But it's also drawbridge up. Buddy, um, until you follow Jesus, you're on the out. So there becomes this line. And that becomes quite evangelistic too. Think, oh, I want to, I, I wish I could be part of that. And maybe we're going to think, you know, so the Lord's Supper becomes evangelistic as well. So it's for building up believers. It's also for reaching out to newcomers.